Predicting earthquakes is impossible. No one could have known that the Indonesian earthquake was about to happen. And no one can say when Cascadia will strike. But it is possible to look back at the geological record and see how frequently earthquakes occur on a particular fault. Sure enough, the Washington coast does hold traces of several past megathrust earthquakes from even before 1700. About 2,500 years of earthquake history, one, two, three, four events recorded. Radiocarbon ages show that this event happened about 600 years BC, and that this event happened about AD 400. So something about a thousand years between this event and this event, a very, very long time. This event's from about AD 700. There are only about three centuries between this event and this event. This is about the same amount of time as between here and today. So this is why it would not be surprising if while we're standing here, another one of these great Cascadia earthquakes happened and we have to run to high ground. And that is the problem. The next megathrust earthquake may not happen for centuries. Or it could be imminent. No one knows. We don't know whether the entire Cascadia fault will rupture like it did in 1700. We don't know how badly affected the modern cities will be. But Yumei Wang, director of geohazards for Oregon, believes we must still take action. We know that a Cascadia earthquake is inevitable. We can't prevent earthquakes, but one thing that we can do is prevent a lot of the damage. We can save lives if we prepare now. That preparation must be based on our current understanding of what the next Cascadia earthquake will be like. What follows is a reconstruction based on the knowledge of leading experts of what may happen, what it would look and feel like to experience a megathrust earthquake. We don't know what actually sets the earthquake off, but typically um, it would probably start at some rough spot on the fault. The rupture is most likely to start at one end of the fault. It would then spread along the fault at over 7,000 miles per hour. As it tears, the North American plate, which has been pushed inwards, would spring back releasing the strain. There may be a region four or five hundred kilometers long where the, the seafloor has suddenly risen up by two or three meters. It happens so fast that it lifts up the whole body of the water on top of it. And as a result, suddenly the, the sea surface finds itself two or three meters higher than it was before over a large area, and that sets off a wave. This is the tsunami, which would radiate out in all directions. Part of it would head out into the Pacific, and part would head directly for the coast of North America. It travels at the same speed, roughly, as an airliner uh, out in the open ocean, perhaps 600 miles an hour. Even at that speed, it would take many hours to reach the other Pacific nations. It would take five hours to reach Hawaii, and more than 10 hours to reach Japan. Thanks to the sophisticated Pacific Tsunami Network, those countries would get a warning. The quake will be detected by a network of seismographs. Um, the tsunami, if they form, will be spotted and identified and tracked by seabed sensors 
which will send via buoys on the surface a radio message via satellite to the emergency authorities in the countries around the Pacific Rim who might be affected. It's then their job to tell their populations to evacuate the coastal region. This warning system should make the distant effects of a Cascadia earthquake very different from the events of Boxing Day. I think that the loss of life remote from the actual location of the Cascadia earthquake will be, will be small when the next big event occurs. And this is because although the waves travel at the speed of a jumbo jet, maybe eight or nine hundred kilometers an hour across the Pacific, it's a huge ocean basin. And it will take many hours for the waves to reach places like Hawaii and Japan, which will probably be badly hit, but they will have plenty of time to evacuate people to, to safe ground. But the situation in the Pacific Northwest would be very different. The tsunami would arrive there in half an hour. And they'd have the earthquake to deal with first. The seismic waves which carry the shaking would be traveling through the earth at over 10,000 miles per hour, much faster than the tsunami. In just a few seconds, the earthquake would reach the land. The earthquake would be at its most violent here on the coast. They're right at ground zero of the shaking, so the shaking they feel will be the largest of anybody because they're nearest to the fault rupture. But the shaking wouldn't have reached the inland cities yet. People here wouldn't even know that an earthquake had started. However, news would have reached the emergency services. This is the Washington State Emergency Operations Center. It would be one of the first places to receive an alert from the Tsunami Warning Center. Plenary magnitude nine. We're activating our ELC to a phase three for a tsunami. Horizon Film Board rehearsing for a major earthquake. The two on-duty officers would immediately activate the center and start calling in staff. And what could be your possible ETA to the ELC? Okay. Their job would be to coordinate the emergency response. But there would be no time to issue a public warning before the earthquake hits the big cities. Up to two minutes after the start of the earthquake, the seismic waves would reach the city of Seattle. Because of the distance, the different types of seismic wave would have separated out, with the faster compression waves reaching the city first. The first thing you sense uh, is a vertical acceleration. You get pushed up a little bit, and you think it's maybe uh, a jolt of a train going by or something of that type. But then uh, later, maybe uh, 20 seconds even later, you might feel start to feel the, the shear waves coming in, which are shearing motions in the earth, the kind of motion that does most of the damage. These shear waves would move the earth from side to side by as much as a meter. There would also be surface waves, like ocean waves rippling through the solid earth. If you uh, are at, in a parking lot, it's likely that you see waves rolling across the parking lot, like if you took a carpet and shook it. As the shaking becomes more and more intense, people would realize that this was no ordinary earthquake. That shaking will continue to build. You'll feel the first sway, and it'll start to build and build and build, and you'll wonder when it's going to stop. Indoors, objects and furniture would be hurled around the room. Parts of the building may start to fall. Right when you feel the earthquake shaking, what we train people to do is to duck cover and hold. Schools and offices now practice this life-saving maneuver, going under a strong desk and holding onto it. Anything that might fall won't fall on you directly. It will fall on the table, and the whole time you protect your head.